Good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this Monday, December 12, 2011, broadcast of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dykes. Now, coming up in this broadcast, we have a very special interview with pharmacist Ben Fuchs. He's going to give you a, a, a wealth of information on nutrition and vitamin supplements and how you can improve your health. It's such an extended interview. We have a part two also coming up later this week. But first, in the news... Uh, it has come to the surface that the very controversial National Defense Authorization Act, uh, well, is even worse because of who was behind the terrible language in the bill, which was written by Carl Levin, Senator, as well as John McCain, Senator. The Obama administration demanded power to indefinitely detain U.S. citizens. It was the White House who removed language that would have protected Americans from Section 1031 of the NDAA bill. Section 1031 of the NDAA bill, which itself defines the entirety of the United States as a battlefield, allows American citizens to be snatched from the streets, carted off to a foreign detention camp, and held indefinitely without trial. The bill states that any person who has committed a belligerent act faces indefinite detention, but no trial or evidence has to be presented. The White House merely needs to make the accusation totally in violation of due process and everything in the Bill of the Rights. Uh, the article goes on to discuss how it was the administration that asked us to remove the very language which we had in the bill which passed the committee we removed it at the request of the administration that's senator carl levin talking and now we have a video clip of him saying the same and i'm wondering whether the senator is familiar with the fact that the language the language which precluded the application of section 1031 to american citizens was in the bill that we originally approved in the Armed Services Committee and the administration asked us to remove the language which says that U.S. citizens and lawful residents would not be subject to this section. Is the senator familiar with the fact that it was the administration that asked us to remove the very language which we had in the bill which passed the committee and that we removed it at the request of the administration that would have said the app that this determination would not apply to U.S. citizens and lawful residents. I'm just wondering, is the senator familiar with the fact that it was the administration which asked us to remove the very language, the absence of which is now objected to by the senator from Illinois? I, I'm familiar now because the senator from Michigan has shared that fact with me. And so again, that's legislation that would have, uh, at least in the language, protected American citizens from this indefinite detention. And Levin says it was the White House who asked him to remove it. This is a part of a larger problem because so much of the secret junk that goes on is cloaked under national security, which is all part of the executive branch overreach. It's been going on through many presidents, George W. Bush, chief among them. Obama's a big part of that problem as well. I wanted to read this paragraph. The Obama administration never had a problem with Section 1031 of the bill and indeed acted to ensure it applied to American citizens. Doubts over whether or not Obama would veto the bill only arose out of issues with Section 1032, not the same section, which pertains to the military being required to take custody of individuals. So if Obama vetoes the very large NDAA National Defense uh, Authorization package, it may well be because of the issue with Section 1032 and not with Section 1031, the controversial section talking about indefinite detention of Americans. So so we're going to look out for a possible stunt, a switcheroo, uh, making your cake and eating it too, having your cake eating it too, something to watch. In other terrible news, the internet piracy bill, a freedoms of speech kill switch, that's in the Hill today. Uh, they talk about how the U.S. Justice Department, under the Stop Online Piracy Act, could shut down any internet site it doesn't like on nothing more than a whim. Under the so-called Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA, the federal government which has prohibited constitutionally from abridging free speech or depriving its citizens of their property without due process, would engage in both practices on an unprecedented scale. In and in establishing the precursor to a taxpayer-funded thought police, taxpayer-funded thought police, it would dramatically curtail technology investment and innovation wreaking havoc on our economy and goes on to talk about how any accuser or competitor 
uh, needs to do in order to obtain an injunction relief is point the finger at a website. And obviously, they can use this to sh selectively shut down almost anything. They also reported on it uh, here in the Washington Post in the article Overkill on Internet Piracy. Of course, InfoWars has been warning about the internet kill switch bills that the Senate and others have tried to introduce for years. Paul Joseph Watson wrote the Senate to sneak through internet kill switch bill back in August 26th of 2010. Uh, he also wrote about it in June 25th of 2010. Obama could shut down internet for four months under new emergency powers. A uh, new bill gives Obama kill switch to shut down the internet. That's Paul Joseph Watson in June of 2010 also and a whole lot more. The point is they're going to use these claims of copyright infringement to protect the m music and movie industries and the rest of it to shut down what ultimately will amount to, and I assure you of this, political speech. This website's under threat. Every website, especially where it values freedom, is completely under threat by this awful legislation. Now, you heard about the EAS EAS emergency alerts. The government did a test on TV and radio last month in October. They also announced they want to soon do them on internet and cell phones. Uh, Verizon was the first cell phone network to sign up for that. And here it is, unannounced Verizon emergency alert causes panic in New Jersey. An unannounced test of soon to be mandatory emergency alert system caused panic in New Jersey after Verizon customers received text messages warning them that a civil emergency was in progress and to take shelter, prompting alarm and a flood of 911 calls. And it goes on to discuss all the chaos from there. It was almost certainly a government message. In fact, the exact wording that Verizon cell phone customers received was civil emergency in this area until 124 Eastern. Take shelter now, U.S. govern. Reason for alert indeed. And the point is they're going to take over all means of communication, including the more recent types, cell phone and Internet communication with their emergency alerts, uh, which have other reasons as well. Now, Paul Joseph Watson has also written on the report that says Iran is about to practice closing the Strait of Hormuz. They're going to do a drill to close the key choke point that would send oil prices skyrocketing to $300 to $500 a barrel. More reason to think that a wider war could be beginning. Kurt Nemo reports on whistleblower activist Sybil Edmonds' warning that foreign military groups are amassing on the Jordan side of the Syrian border. U.S. NATO troops reported on Jordan's border with Syria. Uh, of course, that country is under target as well. There's a covert war going on there, as well as in the wider part of the Middle East. We'll keep an eye on the geopolitical situation in the days to come. Meanwhile, uh, Holder has essentially admitted that the Justice Department lied to Congress, uh, you know, said his little reasons about it's only a state of mind. Uh, now they're discussing in the Daily Caller how Holder may be holding on to private emails about Fast and Furious, a largely overlooked exchange from Thursday's House Judiciary Committee includes what appears to be an admission from Attorney General Eric Holder that emails to and from him about Operation Fast and Furious may exist and that he's refusing to provide them to Congress. Uh, just more reason he should be further questioned, uh, fired, and probably prosecuted. Meanwhile, Attorney General Eric Holder's coming here to uh, Austin, Texas, where we broadcast from, and Kurt Nemo has written an article urging people to protest his appearance at the LBJ Library in Austin at their main auditorium there. Holds several thousand. It's apparently by invitation only. Uh, and he cites how Holder had a significant role in the Waco siege in the bombing of the Oklahoma City building and all the rest of it, all the nasty stuff he's been involved in. That's right, it's not just Fast and Furious. These criminals have a total track record and that's why they're tapped time and again for government. That article, of course, up on Infowars.com if you're in the Austin area and want to show Holder what you think, peaceably, of course. And they will try to frame you and arrest you. We've all been through that as well. TSA recruiting junior officers at airports. Uh, at any rate, they have a fake TSA badge that says junior officer that they're giving out to kids. We got this tip from one of our great readers. And uh, remember when you were growing up and wanted to be a police officer, firefighter, or public servant? Now the TSA appears to be tapping children for future recruits. 
Not only are young, impressionable flyers indoctrinated by the unconstitutional checkpoints themselves, but now by a subtle driver to join the team when they could someday get the power to conduct their own pat-downs and body scans. Just crazy what this world's coming to. Now, on the climate gate front, uh, we've covered the meeting in South Africa in Durban, where they're trying to set up uh, essentially a climate debt system. Now, Mark Morano, we've had him on the program from Climate De Depot, writes that the South African activist has slammed the UN's Green Climate Fund as government-to-government -government aid is a reward for being better than anyone else and at causing poverty. It en enriches the people who cause poverty. And he cites an activist by the name of Leon, Leon Liu, who said the UN Climate Fund will wreak havoc on the developing world's poor. Liu explained, the money goes to government, and governments spend it on, of course, themselves, meaning various government projects creating bigger departments, bigger bureaucracies. It's called big bureaucratic capture. They build empires, they build conference centers, and they buy political support. They go and distribute the money to communities where they want support and votes. Not only is the whole climate change issue a concocted fraud for greater world government control, but of course, it's a fraud anyway for bureaucracy, for bad spending, all the stuff everyone's so upset about. Obviously, if they create a giant fund, they're just going to embezzle it and misappropriate it and so forth. But of course, the real reason we cover this story, awesome footage of leading climate gate critic Lord Moncton arriving at the South Durban Conference via parachute. Isn't this great? How old is he again? I forget. He's up there in age, though, and there he is having the time of his life and going to fight tyranny. Good for Lord Moncton. Really interesting guy to meet as well. Durban jump for climate truth. There he is with a tandem instructor, I would imagine, landing near the site of the conference where all the climate change people bring in their propaganda. So why shouldn't Moncton make a spectacle for truth? Yeah, pretty neat. In other news, Rand Paul is now criticizing the leading or what the media tells us are the leading GOP potential nominees, Gingrich and Romney, saying they're not conservative. Of course, Rand Paul's father, Ron Paul, who's running for the uh, nomination, is conservative. He slammed Romney, saying he had defended bailouts as necessary to keep the entire currency of the country worth something. My experience tells me that if we were on the precipice, we could have had a complete meltdown of our entire financial system, wiping out all the savings of the American people, so action had to be taken. No talk about reigning in the Federal Reserve or the real causes of the bailouts or the inherent problem with giving money uh, to the people who acted inappropriately. Meanwhile, current quote front runner Newt Gingrich, claim, he claims to have changed his mind on TARP after having his ear bent by a number of quote very right-wing businessmen. Those unnamed advisors convinced Gingrich that the financial meltdown was a true crisis and the bailouts were necessary to prevent the financial system from suffering a heart attack. If nothing else, even if they're not conservative, there's certainly sellouts who will blow in the wind any which way the lobbyist money sends them. In Latvia, a country that's had a lot of issues, the largest bank fights off a depositor run after rumors of imminent collapse. It nationalized last month after regulators discovered evidence of massive fraud allegedly carried out by the bank's former owner. Depositors were deprived of access to their funds for days. Uh, we've seen this here in the United States with uh, people had their money in MF Global. Of course, it's happening worldwide, and I'm sure this is just the beginning. Of course, Latvia always has had problems, as I mentioned, but Norway, traditionally a very rich country, however, its butter shortage threatens Christmas treats, uh, reads the headline in the AFP. An acute butter shor shortage in Norway, one of the world's richest countries, has left people worrying how to bake their Christmas goodies with store shelves emptied and prices through the roof. Now, this is just an example of what happens when there is a fo food shortage crisis. The price of a pound of butter went up to 350 euros, which is more than $460 U.S., and people were bidding on it on the black and gray markets as well. Just something to keep in mind as uh, the crisis exacerbates. Meanwhile, the Washington Post reports in its Wonk book blog that the real unemployment rate is 11%. 
And they go on to give their reasons that since 2007, the percent of the population that either has a job or is actively looking for one has fallen from 62.7% to 58.5%. That's millions of workers leaving the workforce. It's not because they become sick, sick or old or infirm. That's because they can't find a job, so they stop trying. Uh, but then it goes on after saying that the, quote, real unemployment rate is 11% to explain how the real un un and underemployment rate is measured by the U6 uh, graph, and it's nearly 20%. You can see it in better detail here at Shadow Government Statistics. They've got a chart showing the official, uh, that is the ones you see in headlines, the official U3 headlines. Uh, way down here at the just over 5%, hovering up towards 10%, but that the U6 has consistently been well above 10% since 2008, well in excess of 15% since 2008, on to now, and then how the SGS alternative shows even higher unemployment, over 20%. That's when you factor in all the people who stopped looking for work and a lot of other factors, a way that they measured it up until 1994 when they officially defined out of existence that way of measuring unemployment. So it's all political games is, of course, the point. You also have stuff like this back in August of August 26th of this year, the Federal Reserve official in Atlanta, Chief Dennis Lockhart, said the real unemployment rate was 16%, just more confirmation that the 8% number, 9% number, 10% number you see is all just a concocted joke. They've got another article here in MoneyCentralMSN.com, real unemployment rate 16.6%. That was in 2010, but really things haven't improved. Um, You've seen the numbers move just slightly. Anyway, uh, we'll be back in just a moment with a very powerful interview from Ben Fuchs. He's a pharmacist. You can hear him on the GCN live network. Uh, he's also behind the longevity uh, vitamin supplements that Alex promotes at InfoWarsTeam.com. I've taken these myself. They can help you lose weight. They can help you uh, fix all kinds of health problems. Uh, just check out the basic Alex Team Pack or whatever it is they call it. It's a multivitamin supplement, essential fatty acids, and then if you take that with protein powder, you're going to see incredible results. Stay tuned for that information and a lot of other powerful nutritional information. We'll be back after this. What's up with these sorry politicians? Lots of bark. When it's showtime, whimpering like little shih tzus. You want big cuts. Ron Paul's been screaming it for years. Budget crisis, no problem. Cut a trillion bucks year one. That's trillion with a T. Department of Education, gone. Interior, energy, HUD, commerce, gone. Later, bureaucrats. That's how Ron Paul rolls. Want to drain the swamp? Ron Paul, do it. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. If you believe in this information and want to support its viral spread, go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there, wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. And we're back from break on the InfoWars Nightly News. Now we're joined by pharmacist Ben Fuchs for really an extended interview and everything about health and how really you can solve your own issues just nice. by learning about nutrition and taking it into account. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, Ben. Thank you for having me. I like the way you said that. We can solve our own issues. Mm -hmm. I like, do you ever hear that book, The Constitution of No Authority by Lysander Spooner? No. Lysander Spooner was a lawyer in the 1800s, and he wrote a book called The Constitution of No Authority. And his whole take was that we have to abolish authority. And that, he was talking about it from a political standpoint. I'm talking about it from a health standpoint. I mean, the word authority always trouble, troubled me because the word authority contains the precursor author. So when somebody's an authority, that means they're writing your story. Right. I hate authority. I don't want anybody writing my story. We can write our own story, and nothing is more important when it comes to writing our own story than writing our own story about our health. Mm -hmm. So why don't you give us some of the basics here? Okay, cool. 
Um, well, one of the things I like to do is simplify things. In pharmacy school, we always learn how to educate the public. You know, think about it, the most trusted profession every year is the pharmacist, and why is that? It's because we're trained in taking very complicated information about medicine, information that people really don't have a lot of, uh, don't really understand, and simplifying it and making it more palatable, making it bite-sized for people to grasp. Well, I do that with nutrition. And the way I do it with nutrition is I uh, take this vast, somewhat confusing subject, somewhat overwhelming subject of nutrition. I mean, it's very easy for people just to throw their arms up and say, I give up. And what I like to do is take that vast subject matter and simplify it into bite-sized components. And the way I do it is with what I call the eight chapters of good nutrition. Mm -hmm. and the eight chapters of good nutrition are protein, fat, carbohydrates, fiber, water, vitamins, minerals, and trace nutrients. The first five chapters are I call macronutrients. These are nutrients you need a lot of. The uh, last three chapters are trace nutrients, like the pixie dust that activates the macronutrients. So when it comes to the eight chapters of good nutrition, how do you incorporate that into your lifestyle? How do you incorporate it into your lifestyle in an easy way, in a manageable way? So take chapter one, protein. Your needs for protein are unspeakably huge. The average person needs somewhere around half a gram to a gram of protein per pound of body weight. So you weigh, say, 150 pounds, you're looking at 75 grams to 150 grams of protein if you want to be optimally healthy from a protein standpoint. How are you going to get 150 grams of protein? An egg has around 7 grams of protein. So you're looking, right away, you're looking at 20 eggs just mm -hmm. to get your protein from eggs. From steak or from hamburger, you cook your protein, you don't even really know what you're getting, but it's very difficult to get those kinds of quantities. In order to effectively and manageably get 150, 75 to 150 grams of protein, if you weigh 150 pounds, the only way to do it is to supplement. And the only way to supplement with protein is to make sure that you're getting some kind of quality powder. The most important quality protein powder that you'll ever find is whey protein, by far. Whey is a, 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 a complex food that contains not just protein fractions and not just all of the major protein components which are called amino acids but it contains specifically the kinds of proteins that are important for building things yeah. for building a body because when you think about it where is milk milk is a substance that mammals produce to build uh, an adult mammal from a baby mammal well those fra those factors that are building are concentrated in the portion of the milk that's called whey and they're especially concentrated in the portion of the milk that's called whey protein and whey protein is so easy to get it's available in any health food store it's available through the longevity products and it's really the only way to make sure that you're getting these constant uh, the concentrated amounts of protein that you need through protein powders a but I mean, people probably know about whey from weight, weightlifting and that kind of thing. Exactly. But it's good for everybody? Heck yes, and I'll tell you why. Number one, if a bodybuilder or an athlete is doing something, we should all be doing it because just getting your butt out of bed in the morning is an athletic event. Just getting through your day is, uh, c contains a an athletic component just to function in your day. So if an athlete is doing something for their performance, you want to think of yourself as an athlete of life and you want to see what they're doing to improve their performance so you can improve your performance in the athletics of life. So it's true, bodybuilders love whey protein. Why? Because it builds muscle. However, whey protein contains other factors that make this a stupendously important food. Whey protein contains something called lactoferrin, which is a natural antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Whey protein also contains small uh, components that are called globulins that are important for building the calves immune system. Well when you do whey protein, those little glo globulins that build the calves immune system, they go into your immune system and do exactly the same thing. So not only do you have proteins and amino acids specific for building, but you have lactoferrin which is a, a natural antibiotic and you have immune globulins that support your immune system all in one food. That's what makes whey protein the single most powerful food with the exception perhaps of eggs and human mother's milk. And that's your protein source. Now, some people have a problem with whey protein. Mm -hmm. Some people have a problem with dairy. If that's the case, you have two options. You can use digestive enzymes, which will sometimes get you around the problem with, uh, with the allergens in whey protein. Or you can use some more exotic forms of whey protein that are uh, more heavily processed. Now, you lose some of the value of the mm -hmm. whey protein, but it might be easier for somebody to handle if they have allergies, milk allergies. The second thing you can do is you can go into alternative sources of protein, and there's many. Uh, egg protein is an alternative source of protein. Bean protein, soy protein, not quite as good, but it's an alternative source of protein. Hemp seed protein, again, not quite as good. 
uh, but an alternative source of protein, Brazil nut protein, pea protein, rice protein. These are all sources of protein that you can use in a supplemental fashion. Now, I'm a big believer in food, but one of the big problems with food is we have to cook it and we have to process it, whether that processing involves chopping or dicing or freezing or boiling, whatever that processing is. And whenever you process a food, you lose the nutritional value. The beautiful thing about whey protein is you don't have to process it, or protein powders is you don't have to process it. You just add it into water and drink it. By the way, I'm a bachelor. I don't mm -hmm. really have time to cook or the inclination to cook. So one of the neat things about whey protein is you put it in water, you drink it, or you put it in your blender and you throw a few other things in and you drink it. One yeah. dish to wash, no muss, no fuss, you're well nutriated. Mm -hmm. that's, one of the, that's one of the neat things for, uh, for, uh, about supplementing is it's brain, it brain, uh, brain fart free, brain damage free. It's easy to do, you just add the stuff to water and you drink it. And that's one of the neat things about nutritional supplements as well, is you can get your nutrients without having to waste a lot of time in the kitchen. As far as food goes, that's a whole other story because I, I think foods are very important. But the less work you give your digestive system, the less work you give your digestive system, the longer you will live. So the key to longevity and the key to health and wellness is to figure out a way to get lots of nutrients without lots of calories. Calories represent heat and calories represent work. Mm -hmm. Nutrients are, in a way, they're the opposite. Because your body doesn't have to work, the body actually gets work. The body actually gets energy. The body actually gets the raw materials when you take in nutrients. When you take in calories, the body has to process the calories. Calories represent heat. The body stores those calories. A lot of work goes into the digestion process, digestive process that is bypassed when you use a nutritional supplement program like whey protein powder. And by the way, that's just chapter one. A lot more to it, but that's yeah. just chapter one. Then you go into fat, and oh, another thing, this is another really important thing. Your brain is const constantly reading the blood. See, your brain's in the dark, it's in your head. It doesn't know what's outside there. It, the only way it knows what's in the outside world is by reading the blood that's passing through it. So your brain is constantly scanning the blood for specific nutrients to determine whether you're hungry or not. And when it sees those nutrients, those specific nutrients, it sends the message, hey, we don't need to eat. In other words, it shuts down the appetite. On the other hand, when it's missing those nutrients, it says, go get some food, we're missing nutrients. Well, the key nutrients that the brain is looking for to determine appetite, or lack thereof, is tryptophan, which is a very important amino acid, you can think of it like a protein, and glutamine, which is another very important amino acid, you can think of it like a protein. So essentially, the brain is reading the blood for specific proteins to determine whether you're hungry or not, or whether we're hungry or not. So if you want to shut down your appetite, protein is your best friend. Concentrated protein is your best friend. If you want to lose weight, concentrated protein is your best friend. Because what happens is, your protein levels in your blood rise, and as the blood goes through your brain, your brain reads the protein levels and says, ah, oh, all is right in the world. Now, it's specifically reading the blood for these building amino acids, specifically tryptophan and glutamine, which mm -hmm. from uh, an evolutionary perspective, these were the amino acids that were in the foods that we hunted back when we were paleological, when we lived on the African savanna 50,000 years ago, tryptophan and glutamine meant we just killed a wildebeest or we just killed a zebra. And it's summertime on the African savanna and all is right in the world. So you don't have to go eat, now we can take all that energy, we can put it into muscles. Conversely, when tryptophan levels are low, and glutamine levels are low, protein levels are low in the blood, the brain reads the blood, it sees the protein levels are low, the amino acid levels are low, the tryptophan and the glutamine levels are low, guess what it does? It sends you out to go find food. Store up anything you can Store find. Store it, exactly. And, it's, and what kind of food? Sugar, because sugar is very important to the brain. So when your protein levels are low and your amino acid levels are low, tryptophan and glutamine, you're gonna be on a one-pointed, highly focused hunt for sugar and your brain is going to take that is uh, your body's going to take that sugar and under orders from your brain it's going to store it on your gut or on your butt because it thinks a famine is coming mm -hmm. it thinks winter time is approaching so protein ingestion of protein proper ingestion of protein tells the brain that all is right in the world it's summertime on the african savanna there's plenty of food and we can put all that all those nutrients into building muscle so we can go out and hunt and do all the things human beings are supposed to do. Protein is a dieter's best friend. And I hate willpower, 
Willpower, I don't have any willpower, and I don't believe dieting or good health should be a question of willpower. Because to me, willpower is this battle that's going on in your body. And that's not a good thing. You don't want to have a battle going on in your body. Good health should be as easy as a piece of ripe fruit just dropping off of a tree. And when you give yourself high protein, and you give yourself concentrated amounts of protein, half a gram to a gram per pound of body weight, you'll find that your sugar cravings just naturally go away. If you don't have enough protein and somebody puts sugar in front of you, you can have all the willpower you want. You're going to have a tough time turning that sugar down. You'll be like, my diet starts tomorrow. And that's what most people do. But if you go to your party where there's going to be the, the birthday cake or the cherry pie, and you go load it up on protein, it's going to be much easier to withstand the cravings and the urges and the drives, which are really hardwired in your interest. Your brain is in the dark. It doesn't know it's in the year 2011 in Austin, Texas. It thinks it's on the African savanna 50,000 years ago. So you have to give the brain what it needs in order to be happy on the African savanna 50,000 years ago. So protein is chapter one. Can I go on to continue? This? Let's do it. Okay. Chapter two is fats. And just like uh, uh, protein is a dieter's best friend because it'll get you off the sugar, fat is a dieter's second best friend because it'll get you off the bad fat. The good fat will get you off the bad fat. Our body's need for protein is hardwired and our body's need for fat is hardwired as well. And if you are low fat, if you are deficient in fat, and somebody puts a slice of pizza in front of you, there is no way you are going to be able to withstand that because the drive for fat is built into your brain. So what do you do? You get yourself essential fatty acids. In mm -hmm. Nutrition, whenever you hear that word essential, that means your body can't make it, it has to come in from the outside. And there are two fatty acids, you can just think of them for simplicity's sake as fats. There are two types of fats that are said to be essential because our body can't make it, your body needs it, but it has to come from the outside. If you don't have enough essential fatty acids, whatever fat is sitting in front of you, you're gonna go for it because your body's need for fat, like your body's need for protein, is hardwired. So if you wanna get off the sugar, you go for the protein. If you wanna get off the pizza, or you wanna get off the french fries or the fat, go for essential fatty acids. Now, essential fatty acids, the role in the body is tremendously, tremendously important. But one of the most important places where essential fatty acids play a role is they get converted into something called master hormones. And master hormones are hormones that regulate all of the other hormones. They're transcendent to all of your other hormones and they come directly from essential fatty acids. Without essential fatty acids, you cannot make those master hormones. Master hormones regulate all the opening and closing of your body, all the opening and closing of blood vessels, nerves firing or not firing. Any kind of dynamic movement in the body is regulated by these master hormones which in turn come from essential fatty acids. There are many Americans who go cradle to grave without enough essential fatty acids because they're so difficult to find from food. Yeah. If you're not supplementing, you're not getting them. You can almost one-to-one uh, -one treat mm -hmm. your fat cravings as deficiencies in essential fatty acids. So getting yourself on a good essential fatty acid is unbelievably important. There's two ways to do it. You can do it in liquid fashion. There's yeah. many brands of liquid. Or the easy way to do it is capsules, like the Longevity product, the ultimate EFAs. Mm -hmm. Take three capsules morning, three capsules afternoon, three capsules night. Now, one of the things that happens as we get older is we don't absorb our fats. And so many people are having problems not only getting essential fatty acids, but once they take their essential fatty acids, absorbing the essential fatty acids. So if you have a problem, then you're gonna have to throw in some digestive enzymes or take your essential fatty acids with food. But other than that, if you, as long as you don't have a digestive problem, taking essential fatty acids, generous amounts, maybe nine capsules a day, are one of the fastest ways to demonstrate dramatic improvement in skin health, in blood pressure health, in blood sugar health, and in brain health. And it doesn't take very long. One of the neatest things, uh, I like demonstrating to people how powerful this stuff is so they can see for themselves. Yeah. So here's what you do if you just want to have a quick demonstration. Get yourself maybe nine or 12 essential fatty acids and take them all at once. And let them sit in your stomach for a little bit, let the fats break out of the gel and go into your digestive system. And then see if french fries sound good to you. And I guarantee you, once you get a big jolt of fat into your system, essential fatty acid fat, good fat, you will not be able to eat the french fries. Now your body is constantly using essential fatty acids, so you're gonna feel like french fries a few hours later. But just doing it one time will be enough of a demonstration to show you how powerful nutritional supplementation is for weaning yourself off of the crappy stuff. My favorite thing about essential fatty acids is it makes your skin nice and soft. Now, I've been in the skincare business for a long time. One of the things about skin 
that most people don't recognize is your skin should never be dry. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Almost everybody, almost everybody has a problem with dry skin. There are billions of dollars spent on moisturizers in this country, which do nothing. The moisturizers don't moisturize the skin. They just wax uh, a coating of wax or oil on top of your skin. But you shouldn't need essential, you shouldn't need uh, a moisturizer because human skin is not supposed to be dry. As soon as you start taking essential fatty acids, you notice that your skin isn't as dry. The best thing about essential fatty acids for women is one of the classic signs of EFA deficiency, of essential fatty acid deficiency, is menstrual cramps. Mm -hmm. When women get on essential fatty acids, within two cycles, their menstrual cramps disappear. And this is something that happens across the board. And even better, and that's a good demonstration. That's a powerful demonstration for a woman who's had cramps all her life. All of a sudden you get her on EFA, she doesn't have cramps. But even better, when she takes a month off of her EFAs, because she gets all cocky and says, I don't get cramps anymore, guess what? The cramps come back. <clears throat> It's, that's, how, that's how powerful the connection is between these m physical manifestations of ill health and nutritional deficiencies. So these are hormonal. Does it work the same for men and women? Absolutely. I mean, does men, it work in the right respective yeah, ways? Heck yes. Men make hormones too. These are, yeah. see, here's how a hormone works. You have a cell, right? Think of a little circle like you saw in biology class. It's not really a little circle. It's a blob. But think of their little circle like you saw in biology class. Your little circle on the outside of a cell has little spaces. Those are called receptors. And the way a hormone works is a hormone will sit in one of those spaces the way a plug sits in a socket, mm -hmm. and it will cause a chemical reaction to happen. That's a little bit simplistic. There's a few other things that happen. But basically, a hormone is like a plug. It sits in a socket. Essential fatty acids go to make or get converted into master hormones. Not hormones, master hormones. Now, what is a master hormone? A master hormone is a component that affects how the plug is going to hit the socket. So without these master hormones, the plug doesn't hit the socket as effectively, none of your hormones work as effectively. Not only that, but essential fatty acids are part of the outside part of a cell. It's called a cell membrane. And that membrane is composed of essential fatty acids. Without essential fatty acids in your diet, the cell membrane becomes dysfunctional, and once again, the plug can't, hit in, can't fit into the socket because the cell membrane is out of shape. Thirdly, and this is very, very important, Essential fatty acids are oxygen magnets. And this is why they're sitting in the outside part of a cell. Because the, as the essential fatty acid is sitting in the outside part of a cell, it's attracting oxygen to the cell. It's an oxygen magnet. Oxygen that's attracted to the outside of part of a cell can be absorbed into a cell, and the body and the cell can use that oxygen for energy. Essential fatty acids act to trap oxygen, to localize oxygen near a cell, so that cell can utilize the oxygen. Cancer can be created by suffocating, robbing a cell of oxygen. So essential fatty acids in the cell are the ways the cell protects itself from cancer. In fact, the most powerful strategy for protecting yourself from cancer is to make sure you're oxygenating cellularly through supplements like essential fatty acids and through the lungs and the respiratory tract by making sure you're breathing correctly, which is a whole other story. So essential fatty acids go to make master hormones, they go to make the cell membrane, they act like oxygen magnets, tremendously important, and one of the uh, most functional uh, benefits of essential fatty acids is they can get you to off of the french fries and get you off of the fat. That's true. So just with the first two chapters, bro, you've now lowered your sugar cravings, reduced your sugar cravings, reduced your cravings for fatty foods. Just the first two chapters, you've lost weight. Just the first two chapters. And we haven't even got to chapter three, which is carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates get a bad rap. Everybody wants to be on low carb, right? Low carb diets. You need more carbohydrates than you need any other food group. In fact, roughly 60% 60, uh, 60 or so of your calories should come from carbo. Uh, I shouldn't say that. 40% uh, of your calories should come from carbohydrates. The, the standard, and, and everybody's going to be a little different, but the standard type of uh, uh, division of macronutrients are 40% carbohydrates, 30% protein, 30% fat. That's a good place to be. So most of your calories should come from carbohydrates, but they have to come from one kind of carbohydrate. And this is one of the most amazing, powerful foods on the planet. And the large bulk of your calories should be coming from this one type of food, and that is vegetables. 
vegetables, 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 vegetables. So most of your calories have to come from carbohydrate, but not the carbohydrates that we're getting, vegetable carbohydrates. And you notice I didn't say fruits, right? I said vegetables, not fruits. The problem with fruits is fruits have been bred, genetically modified, not just recently in terms of genetic modification, but genetically modified for eons, for centuries, really, uh, to be super high in sugar yeah. and super high in fructose, specifically, which is a very problematic sugar above and beyond regular sugar. Fructose has its own problems, and fruit sugar, or, uh, fruits are obviously high in fruit sugar, fructose. So you want the bulk of your caloric uh, intake to come from the calories that you get from vegetables. Vegetables, vegetables, vegetables. Now, there's a couple problems with vegetables. The first problem is a lot of the nutrients and vegetables that come with those carbohydrates are fatty and fat soluble. And if you have any problems with fat absorption, if you have any malabsorption issues, 30% of Americans have fat malabsorption problems, you're not going to get the benefits of those fatty nutrients. And those fatty nutrients are very protective against, uh, protected from the sun and protective from toxicity in the environment. So without those fatty nutrients, they're called bioflavonoids and they're called carotenes, and you probably have heard some of these terms, phytosterols. These fatty compounds that are found in vegetables are supposed to be protecting us from the environment, protecting us from the sun, protecting us from toxins, protecting us from uh, pollution. But if you're not absorbing your fats, you have an intestinal problem, you have Crohn's disease, celiac disease, you're not absorbing your fats on some level, what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna lose those nutrients and you're gonna be more sensitive to the sun, you're gonna be more sensitive to skin cancer and other kinds of cancers, you're gonna be more sensitive to environmental toxicities. So what you need to do with your vegetables is you need to mix them with oil. You always wanna mix your vegetables with oil and it's a good idea to slightly heat the vegetables in the oil. Not a lot of heat, but maybe slight steaming. What'll end up happening is the nutrients, the fatty nutrients that are in the Brussels sprouts and the broccoli and, and the cauliflower will come out in the oil and make it easier for your body to absorb. Mm -hmm. So chapter three carbohydrates is, should be mostly vegetables, as much as you can do vegetables, and it should be always mixed with fats. Mix your oils, your fatty acids, your essential fatty acids with your vegetables and go varied on the vegetables. Easy on the beet and carrot. Everybody likes beet and carrot because they're super high in sugar. So easy on the beet and the carrot. Emphasize the bitter vegetables. Medicine and good stuff is always in the bitter vegetables. And you can make bitter vegetables more palatable by slightly steaming them because you release the sugars in the vegetables. All vegetables have sugars in them, but they're tied up and they don't, can't really taste them until you slightly steam them. That's why onions have almost a sugary sweet taste once you start to cook them, mm. or once you heat them a little bit. Same with Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts and broccoli. So chapter three is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates should form the bulk of your caloric intake, but they have to be vegetable carbohydrates, and you can't, uh, you can't possibly get enough vegetables. Vegetables for, more, for breakfast, vegetables for lunch, vegetables for dinner. Veggie juices are an unbelievably important strategy for dieters because you get all of these nutrients, easy to absorb, it's all broken up and pre-digested, and you don't have to uh, go through some of the digestive problems that are associated with, uh, with vegetable intake. By the way, cabbages and cabbage juice is an amazing, amazing medicinal-like compound, medicinal-like uh, food substance for the digestive system. If you have ulcers, if you have any kind of digestive problems, cabbage juice is amazing, amazing stuff. All vegetables are amazing. Cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts are a woman's best friend because they're highly protective against female cancers. Yeah. All of those vegetables, uh, cruciferous vegetables. But I want to I want to get back to the modern day because there's so many processed foods and, and the kind of carbs everybody's been eating. I mean, I followed, yeah, like you said, the first two chapters of this. But the just carb. getting on the ways and the fats, and, and I personally have had a big transformation. Uh, do you want to talk about that stuff right now? Or about the kind of carbohydrates? Do you want to finish your list? Or? Well, no, this is good. The kind of carbo carbohydrates people are eating. Because yeah, you and I were talking yeah. off air about how, about how po the, uh, our political system our governmental system, the hierarchical system that lends itself to totalitarianism is intimately connected with agriculture and farming. The first empire that we know of, the first empire modern hi in, in uh, recorded history was the Sumerian Empire, right? Yeah. The Sumerian Empire appeared out of nowhere, by the way. That's a whole other story, how that happened. But So the Sumerian Empire is the first empire in recorded history. And the Sumerian Empire became an empire because they were one of the first, they were the first civilization that figured out how to farm and how to become big from farming. Now, why is hegemony and t uh, tyranny related to agriculture and related to farming? Well, farming's a lot of work. 
And it's hard to get people to do a lot of work. Not only that, but irrigation requires ditch digging. And so people had to, had to dig ditches, and they're not, human beings aren't inclined to go dig ditches and to go farm if they don't have to. They had to be made to do that. So our political system of tyranny and our governmental system that's based on hierarchy and authority is intimately wed to this idea that people didn't want to farm, but they had to be compelled to farm. And once we had this compulsion into farming, then we, then we figured out, then we could, uh, we didn't have to move around as much. You could have civilizations, you could have towns, you could have cities. So it's in the interest of governmental structure, but it's not in the individual's interest. In the individual's interest, it's to find good sources of food and go to those kinds of food. In the, in, in, in the interest of the country, in the interest of the system, agriculture plays a big role. And so we have, find that wherever, uh, as soon as agriculture came, that's when civilization came, and that's when government came, and that's when political tyranny came. Yeah, and it's interesting, you always know, see in Egyptian hieroglyphs, for instance, they pay taxes in grain. Exactly, and but then, who do they pay taxes to? Yeah. Exactly, they pay taxes to the government. The individual didn't need it. The individual was fine going and hunting a zebra once in a while, but we got convinced into thinking that our lives would be better off if we were farming and we had food that was local and we didn't have to go out and, and hunt and forage for food. But our health began to decline as soon as we started to farm, and our health okay. didn't catch up until the turn of the 20th century when we got more protein in our diet. In the Middle Ages, you ever seen those, I don't know if I was telling you, I was telling somebody, in the Middle Ages, uh, you, sometimes you go to a museum and they'll have little houses or little beds and they show you how people lived in the Middle Ages. The beds were really small, the houses were really small, people were four foot ten and five foot two, and they only lived to be 20 years old yeah. in the Middle Ages. Our Cro-Magnon ancestors were big, strong, muscular people. The, our hunter-gatherer ancestors were six foot tall and muscular. And when archaeologists or anthropologists are looking at bones and they want to date the bones, they look at the bones and they see if the bones were weak or they see if the bones were strong. And if the bones were weak, they say, oh, grain-eating culture. And if the bones were strong, they say, oh, protein, meat-eating culture, hunter-gatherer cultures. So our, not only did our system of political tyranny emerge with the advent of agriculture, but our decline in health emerged as well. And it didn't catch up until very recently. In fact, arguably, it hasn't even caught up. Yeah, why don't you talk about those founding father quotes? Because I always you think like about those what, I always think about what Henry Kissinger said. Not only that food is a weapon, but that if you control the food, you control the population. Isn't that amazing? And uh, yeah, not only does it go back to the history of agriculture. I mean, it was part of the history of the founding. Of That's this right. Country. Benjamin Rush and Thomas Jefferson, two of the founding fathers who signed the Declaration of Independence, warned against the uh, centralization of medicine. Thomas Jefferson said, "If you limit people's ability to access health freely," of their own volition, deciding what they want to do themselves, then you can control the people. Can we pull up those quotes? They're very interesting. And Benjamin Rush said the same thing. Benjamin Rush, by the way, is a physician. He yeah. Was, and he warned about it. Here's that quote. The, um, this is Benjamin quote? Rush, the Constitution of the Republic should provide should make special provision for medical freedmen, freedom. And he said this in 1787, this is amazing to me, to restrict the art of healing to one class will constitute the Bastille of medical science. All such laws are un-American. He says this in 1787, this is amazing. And, uh, uh, and despotic. Unless we put medical freedom in the Constitution, the time will come when medicine will organize into an undercover dictatorship and force people who wish doctors a treatment of their own choice to submit to only what the dictating outfit offers. This is what managed health care is, exactly what Benjamin Rush warned against. Managed health care is when you go to uh, HMO and they, come, they select what kind of medicines you get based on what kind of illness you have, based on what the book tells you. And that's what Obamacare is, Aaron. This is the, this is the promise of Obamacare. Man Managed healthcare, where you go into a, a, some kind of institution, you walk in there, he takes your blood, the doctor takes your blood pressure, they look in a book and to see what, what mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a prescription should be uh, dictated to you based on what your blood pressure reading is, based on what your cholesterol reading is, and you get that medicine. And by the way, that medicine is bought in bulk from some pharmacy comp from some pharmaceutical company, and you get to have it, or the HMO gets to buy it cheap if they agree to dispense just that brand for your particular. Yeah, of course. And it's related to the same reason we see the FDA and the other entities trying to intimidate people for growing vegetables and exactly and selling exactly. Raw milk or, and or the rest books. Of it. Even they burn books if the books say something that they shouldn't say. Well, yeah, he talks too about locking up the medical knowledge. 
the alternative stuff we're trying to get out now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that, you know what? That's what the internet is about. That's, we're so lucky for now. I don't know what's happening in the future, but for now, Aaron, gathering information is the most important thing you can do. The reason I do what I do is because I want people to have this kind of information. For the listeners, for people who are out there, there is nothing more important than gathering information about this whole, uh, about how we take care of our bodies and how we don't take care of our bodies. To me, our access to the internet that we have for now is yeah. a, a gift from on high. Let, let's take a look at the Jefferson quote too. Do we have that? If the people let the government decide what foods they eat and what medicines to take, their bodies will soon be in a sorry state, as are the souls of those who live under tyranny. Isn't that great? That's Thomas Jefferson. Not sure on the year of that quote, but regardless, it's from the founding period. And that really is part of the fight. We're trying to uh, have a revolution of the mind here, but that goes right along with the bodies. And that's what the InfoWar and the rest of it is all about. Well, InfoWar is information. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what that is. Now, personally, I'm a healthcare professional, so I focus on health. But I'm also involved, uh, I follow what's going on politically, and I follow what's going on in terms of the New World Order, in terms of the centralization of power on all levels. But if we're sick, Aaron, Mm -hmm. If we have cancer, if we have uh, colon problems or Crohn's disease, if we have autoimmune problems, or if we're just a slave to food where we can't stop eating, we will not have the wherewithal, we will not have the power, we will not have the strength to fight this new world order. So, th to me, this is a precursor to the great battle. Taking care of your body, taking care yeah. of your health, disengaging from the foods they want you to eat. If, if somebody is singing a song to you about a food that you're supposed to go out and eat, that's a food you don't want to eat. Yeah. If there's a commercial, <laughs> if there's a jingle, if there's a model, if there's a little cartoon character, that is something you don't want to go near. And that's the kind of decisions we have to make. We're being manipulated through our food choices. So as an independent human being, as a free-thinking human being, it should be an insult to anybody to drive through the Golden Arches or to go through Wendy's or to eat that kind of food because that's how we're being, that's how our power is being usurped from us. That's how we are being controlled through the water we're drinking, through the beverages we drink, through the foods we eat, and through the air we breathe. So personally, I consider it a, an insult to my intelligence to, uh, if I, to go through some kind of drive through to have a hamburger or, or french fries. I feel personally offended by somebody trying to sell me well, that Well, they've stuff. taken all the psychology, psychology knowledge and used it against us. It's from Maslow awful. to Bernays. You know about yeah, Edward Bernays? Edward Bernays exactly. Oh, my God. The torches of Well, he was the nephew of Freud, so exactly. they Exactly. Do stuff. you know Edward Bernays was hired by the Beechnut Packing Company to get more sales for bacon, and he invented the bacon and egg breakfast yeah. that we all eat today? <laughs> That's some good PR. Well, I've seen that documentary, <laughs> The Century of the Self. It's very interesting. Exactly. Edward Bernays knew all this stuff. See, they, that's when they started to figure that we can manipulate the mind. They didn't even know about the mind from a scientific perspective until Freud. Freud's big yeah. advance was he said that there's these unconscious drives that we have, and those can be manipulated. I love this. There's a funny story, and I think it was in that Century, Self, Century of the Self video with the uh, cake mix. Do you remember the story with the cake mix? Not offhand. They, uh, they were trying to sell women... A pro, uh, Pack, uh, powdered cake mix and women didn't want to buy it because they were like no I'm a woman I know how to bake I'm not gonna buy a powder cake mix they found yeah. it insulting right so what they did is they did all these uh, focus groups to figure out why woman women weren't buying the processed powder cake mix and they found out that because women felt like it was taking their womanhood away they figured out well We'll tell women to crack an egg in the, in the powder cake so mix. So they feel like they're doing they something. They feel like yeah. they're doing something, and all yeah. of a sudden, the cake, the cake mix sales went through the roof, and to this day, people are buying powder cake mix simply because they think they have to add an egg. You don't need an egg in there. They just told you to add an egg because it would make you feel like you were doing something. The point being that that was when we figured out, or that's when marketers figured out, that there was a way to, uh, to get people to buy things, to hit their buy buttons. In fact, there's a book out now called Biology. Yeah. Have you seen that? B-U-I. Biology, biology, which is the science of how we buy. They have it down, and by the way, the, the Obama campaign was like almost a pinnacle in all of this, understanding how to manipulate people. Um, po politicians use this all the time. But today, they can actually track your movements in a grocery store to see how much time you're spending at each shelf on the grocery store. And they have these new interactive devices that are being put on shopping carts and supposedly they're going to tell you, uh, they'll be personalized based on your buying habits, based on your little frequency buyer card. They'll know exactly what Aaron likes to buy and as you're wheeling the shopping cart through there, they'll go, sale on Twinkies! 
Say on whatever, whatever you like to well, buy. We'll become such slaves. We allow these malls to track us on the smartphones. You'll be tracked, time. exactly. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but they have iris scanners, and they'll track your eye movements to see how much, uh, how long you're spending focusing on this box or that box, and they'll know how to position things based on the information that they gather. Look, we're going to do a whole part two covering a lot more uh, how to address certain diseases and, and what's at the heart of it all. Uh, but I also wanted to get into a little bit of my personal story because I have been listening to your show for about six months now and it finally sunk in just from your first two points that you got to take the protein and you got to take the essential fats. Right. And I've lost a ton of weight That's just awesome. doing that alone. Uh, some moderate exercises and taking these longevity supplements that we have uh, at InfoWarsTeam.com and then of course your radio show at BrightSideBen.com there I am six months ago that's amazing and, yeah I've lost somewhere on the order of 65 pounds okay. or so but Aaron here's the thing <laughs> I, we all it's great you lost weight and I love that we look good and you lose weight and it's great that you could see that you lost weight because yeah. it's a way to visually demonstrate for you how effective a nutritional supplement program like the longevity products can be but what's really important Aaron is you just added a decade to your life you just reduce your risk of arthritis. You just reduce your risk of heart disease. You reduce your risk of cancer. You reduce your risk of stroke. You reduce your risk of dying from all the things that Americans die from. And, yeah. and I don't care about dying personally. I don't have a fear of death. But what I don't want to happen is I don't want to get a stroke. And I don't want to have an aneurysm. And I don't want to end up in a wheelchair. And I don't want to end up where I can't move my body. And that is the prognosis, unfortunately, of most Americans if they continue down the road that they're on. What you just did, in addition to losing 60 pounds and looking good, yeah. You added years to your life and reduced your risk of degenerative disease and breakdown. And to me, that is key. Well, I don't like being a slave to the system either. And then that's another thing. How, how, how uh, demeaning it is to be a slave to French fries or to be a slave to, to some kind of processed food that somebody is, is trying to sell you that could care less about you. Do you ever see the person who's making your tacos at Taco Bell? That person could care less about you, and you never want to eat food that is being prepared for it by somebody who could care less about you. And to me, that's the most important reason for not eating fast food and not eating food that's prepared by somebody in a, in, where I can't see what they're doing, is it's very dangerous to eat food that is prepared by somebody who A, doesn't care about you, and B, is trying to extract money from you. But it's really true. When I started taking these supplements, the longevity and some other good herbs too you could find, I mean, I did not have that craving. That was the only thing that's, that's awesome. ever killed those that's terrible awesome. cravings. So. That's awesome. You know, so I never I get tired. for that. I appreciate that. I never get tired of hearing stories like that, but I got to tell you, I hear them over and over and over again. And what seems like a miracle to some folks, to me, it's just, just the way the body works. Yeah. Well, we're going to get into a whole lot more. You'll see it later this week. But for now, that's it for the InfoWars Nightly News. Stay tuned and visit the website, InfoWarsNews.com. You can become a subscriber. Uh, we have a holiday special through the end of the Christmas season where you can get a membership to PrisonPlanet.tv that you could share with five or more friends uh, at a very good discount, uh, $39.95 instead of $71.40. You can also get 18 DVDs with that uh, membership, 70% off, 18 physical DVDs and shiny plastic wrappers you can give out to people, give information this Christmas and holiday season instead of Chinese-made plastic junk and, and otherwise being a slave to that system we were talking about. We'll be back. We'll see you tomorrow. Stay tuned.